On December 2nd, 1997, I accompanied Robert Williams to his death in Nebraska's electric chair. And that was the last state-ordered killing in Nebraska. And many, many of us are determined that it will stay the last. I had been corresponding with Robert for some two and a half years because in 1995 he had also had uh, an execution date which was stayed almost miraculously at the last hour. Um, I was so elated when that execution date was stayed that I wrote to Robert just to tell him how happy I was and Robert wrote back. And so we corresponded then for two and a half years until September of 1997, when Saturday morning I picked up the morning paper and I saw that he had been given another execution date. But with that, I really felt like I needed to at least see if he would like for me to visit because we had become friends. And so I wrote to him and indeed he would like for me to visit. He suggested that I come in under uh, chaplaincy status because the visiting hours are so limited unless you are a chaplain and then you have access any day and any hour of the day and uh, I had been a sister of mercy for 14 years and so they helped me to be qualified to come in as a chaplain uh, which then later became spiritual advisor. As a chaplain I was able to bring uh, bread and grape juice in and we had communion services together and so on. Robert was on death row because 20 years earlier, um, after a life of poverty and abuse and racism, and as a, a 40, about a 40-year-old man who was trying and trying and trying to make it in our society, he had moved to Lincoln, he had married a wife, bought a house, had a job, but he didn't realize that he was... Um, having a hard time just being a normal person. He knew something was wrong, but he didn't know what it was. And one day he was served divorce papers by his wife, and that just was the last straw. That just broke his spirit entirely. He walked off the job. He was drinking and drugging all day. He was filled with grief and, and self-loathing, just somehow or another. What was the matter with him? Why couldn't he just succeed like other people do. He went to the house of two women who were friends of his and he had a gun. They tried to get the gun away from him and he killed them both, raped one. Got in a car and was trying to get to Chicago but he was pretty much out of it, kept running the car off the road, uh, finally wrecked the car, went in search of another car and there was an Iowa farm wife there and he raped and killed her and stole that car and managed to get turned around and end up back in Lincoln where the police arrested him then and put him in jail. And so he said he was a wild man in jail that day, just pounding the bars and just yelling and he asked for the uh, prison chaplain to come visit him and the chaplain would not come. He asked for his own pastor to visit and his pastor would not come. But a, a, a little Quaker man from Lincoln who had heard that Robert had been arrested and was in prison came to visit him and Robert was so startled by that. Uh, the, the little Quaker man ca actually came into his cell with him. And so Robert poured out and poured out and poured out his grief and his remorse and his self-loathing Day after day after day, Herb came back and, and, and sat with him until finally one day Herb said to him, Robert, I am so tired of having your sin in front of my face all the time. When are you going to put this in God's hands and let God take care of it? And that was the turning point for Robert. So he went through the trial. Um, he was guilty, there was no doubt about that, and he was sentenced to death and spent 20 years then on death row. During that period of time, he kept trying and trying to find out, kept trying to understand what it was that had allowed other people who had grown up in situations of poverty and abuse and racism to live good lives. What had he missed? What was missing? So he spent years 
reading and studying. He would get up at 3 o'clock every morning for prayer and reading and studying. He was taking correspondence courses in psychology, theology, history. He was telling me this one day, and I said to him, well, did you ever find it? And he said, yes. I said, what was it? And he said, self-knowledge. So with that, with his understanding of himself and his relationship to God, he was able then to live this exemplary life on death row for these 20 years. He became a mentor to the young ones, the prisoners. Um, as I have talked across the state on other occasions, I, never, I have never spoken without somebody coming up to me afterwards to say my nephew or the neighbor down the street's son or somebody else was in prison with Robert and is making it now because of Robert's example. And even the guards found him someone that they could come to and talk and tell their troubles to. Uh, and so he, he uh, just lived this life. He was determined. What he wanted to do most of all was to show the awesome, the power, the awesome transforming power of God's love in the soul of a human being, no matter what terrible thing they had done, that this is possible. He was not afraid of dying, he, but he was very much opposed to capital punishment. So he did everything he could to avoid uh, being put to death. He went through all the appeals, he went through the whole process, and ended up with a death date for December 2nd, 1997, which is when I sort of come into the picture. So he was moved one week before the execution date. The prisoner is moved from death row to death watch. On death watch, he is moved into the hospital wing, which I find rather strange, but anyway, and had two cells, one in which to sleep, and so there was one single bed in the middle of the room, and that's all. And in the next room, there were two folding chairs for Robert and one person who could be company, and that's all. And then in front of those two rooms sat two big guards, 24-7, keeping their eye on him the whole entire time, or keeping their eye on whoever was the capital punishment prisoner, uh, to make sure that there was no attempt at suicide. You can't allow a prisoner to commit suicide and deprive the state of its ability to kill. The first day that Robert was on death watch, when I got there to visit Robert, I had a message from the chaplain that the chaplain wanted to talk with me. And so I met with the chaplain and he explained that he wanted to go through the procedures on the day of execution so that I would be aware and familiar with what was going to happen. And I sat there, it was very difficult sitting there listening to this recital of how the day would go. Finally he said to me, probably because of my silence, now I know that some people on the outside think that this is pretty awful. He said, but I think after you've been through it once and you recognize the professionalism by which this is done, that you will not feel that way. And I was outraged. And I said to him, I am sorry, sir. I could never respect a procedure or a process that ends in the killing of human beings. And that was sort of the end of the conversation. So for the rest of the week on death watch, uh, the prisoner is weighed every day. We have to be sure that if he's losing weight, the electricity has to be adjusted too much electricity and the body might burst into flames, which would be very distressing for the people who are seeing this. Too little and it might take too long for, the, for death to occur. So that always has to be adjusted. Um, his temperature had to be taken every day. They had to be sure that he stayed well because you can't execute a sick person. So if he gets sick, then you postpone the execution and get him well and then execute. And all of this, all of this for me, uh, it was just so Kafkaesque. It was so difficult to deal with these preparations there so rationally and, and um, you know, just seemingly ordinary, getting ready to kill a perfectly healthy human being. On his 
last night, the night before his execution, when his last meal was served, I was allowed to stay until 11 o'clock that night. When they brought up his final meal, uh, he wasn't hungry. I can sort of understand why. Um, and so they took the meal away, but the guards came back and asked if they could serve us coffee. And we said yes. And so they rolled in a cart. And when I think about this now, I want to say that there were cups and saucers. I know there was coffee and sugar and creamer. I want to say there were cups and saucers. And I don't know now if that's my imagination that has just kind of morphed into this ordinary service. I just remember being very, very touched uh, by the cards doing this. And so they served us coffee with sugar and cream on the night before his execution. Um, on the morning of the execution, I was allowed to come early because we were going to have our last communion service. So I got there at about 6.30, and then I had to wait downstairs. And nobody would tell me what I was waiting for, but I was waiting and waiting, and finally I was allowed to go upstairs. Well, it was because Robert had overslept on the morning of his execution. That's how at peace he was. Um, so uh, we had our final communion service, and at his prayer, he prayed and he prayed during our, our communion service for the family and the loved ones of the women that he had killed. And he prayed and he prayed for the children of the world that they would be spared the pitfalls into which he had fallen. He prayed for the pardons board who had refused to even have a pardons hearing. He prayed for his friends because he knew that this was going to be difficult for them and he prayed that they would be able to resolve this in good time. And then he prayed and prayed that this would be the last state-ordered killing in Nebraska. After our communion service, uh, there were some friends of his that were allowed to come up, and we sat in a circle together, Robert trying to tease the tears away, trying to keep everybody's chin up, trying to help us all cope. I remember at one point somebody began singing, will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by. And of course Robert assured us that we this was only a temporary separation. We would all be together again someday. There was a point at this when his friends were there that uh, one of the guards in the hall, again, guards everywhere, one of the women guards broke ranks and came in and put her arms around him and said, I could lose my job for this, but I have to go downstairs now and I won't see you again. And I have to tell you goodbye. So after the company left, I had some time with Robert until I also had to leave while he was prepared for execution, while he was shaved and diapered and dressed in a brand new prison uniform with a long-sleeved shirt so that the burns on his arms wouldn't show. Uh, the seam on the left pant leg was ripped up to mid-thigh so that it would be easy to access his leg for the electrodes. Um, and then I was, uh, I was sitting out in the hall while all of this was going on, and I was sitting with the chaplain, the same chaplain that I had not had much conversation with on the first day, and I said to the chaplain, you know, if this kind of a murder were taking place out on the street, this premeditated, this cold-blooded, this ritualistic, it would be murder most heinous. Well, I didn't get a response. During that time, Robert also had a press conference during which he again professed his profound sorrow for what he had done and pardoned the pardons board. 
in the meantime, I'm sitting out in the hall, and I must admit, I was feeling a great, great deal of anxiety and pain. And suddenly I became aware of the fact I knew that there were people in Omaha, in, in Nebraska, all over the United States, and even in faraway countries, because word of this had spread, that were praying for me and for Robert. And while I sat there, there was a moment at which I just suddenly, it was as if I could feel all of the anxiety draining right out of me into the floorboards. And in came <laughs> this great strength and deep, deep peace. And so with that, I was able to go back to Robert. Um, and we had a, a, a few more minutes together. Um, and then finally the warden came in and said, it's time. And so I was escorted out again. And six big guards came down the hallway in military fashion, up, two, three, four, marched into Robert's room, and then I could hear all of this strange noise. I kept wondering what in the world was going on. Finally, they marched out again with Robert in the midst, and I could see that he had been bound with those plastic straps that just make a lot of noise. Uh, he had a big band around his waist, and his wrists were fastened together and fastened to the band around the waist and his legs were shackled. And so I fell in behind Robert and we went off down the hall. I was uh, reading to him the prayer of St. Francis, which I had paraphrased so that it would say, Robert, our God has made you an instrument of God's peace. <laughs> Where there was hatred, you have sown love and so on. So we got to the elevator, and the elevator was quite crowded with the six big guards and Robert and I, and uh, with Robert and me, and other prison dignitaries riding down the elevator. Robert sang out, I am on the mountaintop, I am on the mountaintop. I said, good Robert, stay there. And then we began singing the old spiritual, Before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Then the elevator door opened and there was the execution chamber. Robert was pushed into the chamber. I was pushed the other way. Robert looked over his shoulder at me and I said to him, Tell God hi for me. And off I went. And I had to go past those six big guards and they were sobbing. So I was escorted around and back into the witness room where his attorney and some of his friends were also waiting. And then on the other side of the witness room were witnesses for the state. Finally, the curtains were opened and there sat Robert in the chair. And I was just taken aback by how tightly he was fastened into the chair. It didn't look like he could hardly breathe, but he did look, first of all, for the husband of the Iowa farm wife. Um, he, had made, he had made amends with two of the families, but he had not been able to make amends with this family. And so he was there, the husband was there. And he called out to him how very, very sorry he was for what he had done. And then he blew kisses to his friends. And I remember that one of the reporters who was there in the uh, witness room wrote in the paper that Robert was radiant in the chair. And he was. Anyway, finally he looked over his shoulder and he called, OK, I'm ready now. So they closed the curtain. And then we sat and waited and waited. Finally, the curtain was opened again, and it was really hard to tell that there was a human being sitting in that chair. It looked like some kind of a scarecrow with a rubber mask on his face. The face is covered because the force of the electricity could pop the eyeballs out. And this grotesque electrical cap. So I heard 
the generator just a split second before I saw the force of electricity slam him back into the chair. It surprised me. Uh, he had looked like he was fastened so tight, I didn't know anything like that was possible. So there was that jolt and then silence, and then a second jolt, and then a third. And then we sat there and waited and waited and waited and finally a person came in and felt for the carotid artery and pronounced him dead. Well, I found out afterwards they have to wait that period of time because the body is too hot to touch. So, after this experience, I have been talking to people a lot about this what I keep saying is, I believe the death penalty says more about us than it does about the person in the chamber. If we know that this person, as in Robert's case, did in fact commit these killings, now we're going to do the same thing. If someone has killed under the influence of drugs and alcohol and in a rage is what usually happens, but we're doing this stone cold sober. One of the reasons why I have worked so hard ever since then to be sure this never happens again is for the soul of society. I think we do violence to our own souls when we allow this to happen, when we allow the state to kill in our name. In a democracy, we all have our finger on that button or on that switch that kills another human being. We are aware of the fact of how hard this is on prison personnel, uh, the sobbing guards. This is not what they were hired for, to strap down a perfectly healthy and alive human being and kill that person. So I have worked ever since to make sure this never happens again. I have to also tell you that on the day after Robert's execution, I went to the mortuary to view his body. The mortician told me he had never seen such a smile on the face of a, de of a dead person. Medical people tell me this smile is not possible. Uh, the electricity just um, contracts the muscles so tightly that then they just flop. But nevertheless, there it was. For me, that smile is a rainbow at the end of this story of Robert's execution. Uh, but the story really hasn't ended. We keep working, and we keep working to make sure that Robert's execution is the last one. And thank you for listening. Amen. <laughs>